Well, I'd like to welcome everybody out to the, I guess this is the opening conversation of the American Atheists Conference 2015 in Memphis, Tennessee. The reason we're here today is to better understand some of the myths and misconceptions that the general public seems to hold about various religions and worldviews to talk about the engines and drivers of these misunderstandings and to, to maybe even talk about antidotes and the things we can do to have a more honest, forthright conversation and uh, develop a more civil society. So uh, I'm Chris Davis. I'm a reporter for the Memphis Flyer and I will be your moderator for this event. And um, I guess we'll start by just letting the panel introduce themselves. Okay, uh, well, welcome everybody. Can you hear me? Uh, we, have, we, have, we have no Still power. Still have to push them. Push them. Oh, is there a button? Ah, there you there's go. a microphone button. Okay. Uh, hi, everybody. Thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is David Silverman. I'm the president of American Atheists. We're the ones who are sponsoring this event, and uh, as well as sponsoring the National Convention for American Atheists, which uh, begins tomorrow and goes through the weekend. It's going to be a fantastic convention, and I'm really, really happy to welcome everybody here. Thank you all for coming to, uh, to participate on this panel discussion uh, to raise awareness of uh, the diversity of the beautiful Memphis County, Memphis City. Thank you. Hi, I'm Ahmed Sayed from Expo Schools of North America. Um, we're a community building organization that is trying to unify its Muslim voices across Canada and the U.S. Um, I'm very happy to be here. This is, I think, the largest presence of ex-Muslims at any conference, and uh, Ayan Hirsi Ali is going to be here. There are uh, four or five other ex-Muslims that are presenting at various points during the conference. Thank you all for attending. My name is Cole Huffman. I'm the uh, senior pastor of First Evangelical Church, which is in uh, I-240 Poplar uh, area of Memphis. I've been there 12 years, uh, married, I uh, have children. Uh, my name is Yasser Khali. I am the resident scholar of the Memphis Islamic Center. I'm also a professor of religious studies at Rhodes College. All right, so let's get started um, with kind of the big question. And the big question is, what do you consider to be some of the more important uh, misunderstandings about your religion or worldview? Um, and let's just, let's just start here and move down the table. Well, the most important um, misconception about atheism is that we don't exist. That's, that's the biggest problem that we're facing, that people don't think atheism exists, uh, or people think that atheists are such a small minority that we can be discounted. As a result, it is politically correct to, uh, to trash atheists uh, in front, you know, trash atheists from the stage, talk poorly about us. Uh, it is politically correct for, for politicians to just throw us under the bus for any kind of reason that they want. So I think uh, the biggest problem that we atheists have is that people think we don't count. People think we're not enough to count. And one of the reasons that we bring our conventions to Memphis this year, Salt Lake City last year, is because people assume in a Bible Belt city such as Memphis that everybody's Christian. Oh, everybody is religious at least. Um, and no, there are tons and tons of atheists right here in Memphis, um, and we're here to raise the awareness of the fact that Memphis is a beautifully diverse city. So going off what uh, David said, the same thing exists in Muslim circles as well. Um, if you ask most Muslims, they will say that ex-Muslims don't exist, doubt does not exist. The idea is that everything within Islam is perfect, and therefore nobody can really doubt if you do not walk away from the truth. Um, there are, if you look at well, about 14 countries in the world, uh, criminalize apostasy and kill you for publicly stating that you're not Muslim. Um, because of that, there's a huge chilling effect and most people that do not believe aren't willing to speak about it publicly. Um, even people that have written anonymously have been tracked down and arrested in various countries. Even in the US, um, we launched in 2030 and it was the first time any organization had ever tried to work and build up uh, ex-Muslims. So in the 21st century, we still have to operate in private because we're concerned about the consequences. And I would say pretty much every single ex-Muslim that has been open has received death threats at one point or the other. So I've been asked to uh, represent the Christian uh, perspective. And 
when you think about misconceptions, a uh, number of things you can point to. Some misconceptions are going to be born uh, out of uh, more of a culture warrior uh, sort of uh, dynamic that uh, we, we know well in, in American culture. Uh, as a pastor, specifically, I would say that uh, probably uh, a misconception that I find both inside the church and outside the church is that Christianity is essentially a religion for good people. Uh, it's for people who are proving their worth to God. Now again, this is inside the church as well as outside the church, but it's a, it's a misconstrual of what Christian faith is. So the uh, goodness within the Christian uh, dynamic is uh, uh, something that uh, comes as, uh, as one responds to God. It's not something we do to get God's favor and approval. It's something that we give ourselves to, namely uh, the Lord's will and way as we find it in Scripture. Uh, we give ourselves to that in response to what He's done for us. So that uh, Christian emphasis on good works, for instance, is uh, not for the purpose of uh, gaining God's approval or keeping it. It is uh, because uh, God has already uh, given His approval in Christ, and that frees us then to not have to work for our redemption or salvation. It, uh, it means that we, 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 the good things we give ourselves to, we're responding to Him. So that that's a misconception that uh, I, I, I'm sure others will come up as we talk, but that's one that uh, right off the bat I encounter a lot in pastoral work, in particular. I think two minutes is not enough for misconceptions, but it's long. Um, but I think the number one uh, in our times would be the fact that Islam is somehow uh, the greatest source of terrorism and uh, crimes related to political violence in the world. Uh, firstly, statistically, that is simply not correct. Yes, there are Muslim terrorist groups, but all you need to do is look at the FBI's uh, most wanted page and uh, there's a far greater threat from, for example, the far right uh, here in America than there is from uh, Islamic radicals. So the fact that it's not the most quantity-wise, and also what uh, is, and of course I'm a very vocal critic of ISIS and Al-Qaeda, anybody who Googles my name, you'll see uh, the fact that they've actually threatened to assassinate and kill me as well. Uh, but the point is that uh, one needs to understand the socio-political context from within which these terrorist groups emerge. They're not coming from a vacuum and it's very easy to blame simply the religion of Islam. My argument is, and I'm very precise here, yes, there are tenets of Islam that can be misconstrued and feed into radicalism, but the primary cause of Islamic terrorism is a response to social political factors, not a reading of the Quran. Uh, and a simple example of this is ISIS. If you look at our foreign policy in Iraq for the last 30 years, the number of wars and bombings and people killed, it's only natural that there's going to be messianic cults that are being formed that have these bizarre visions of the world. Uh, one cannot ignore uh, the reality of, of, of the people and the social political context uh, from within which these uh, groups emerge. So my point is that Islam is not inherently any more prone to violence than any other system out there, whether it's Christianity or Judaism, whether it's capitalism or democracy. Uh, the fact of the matter is that there are people around the world that do violence in the name of whatever, whatever they believe, and Muslims are also uh, guilty of the same thing all other human beings are guilty of. All right, um, now let's start at the other end and, and sort of follow up on that question, which might be some of the more accurate ways to frame or explain the things that are actually believed, what the actual you know, tenets are. And, and again, I know that two minutes is way too short a time for anyone to accomplish this, but. Um, so I actually gave a lecture here in, uh, in, uh, in Memphis two days ago about the, the, uh, the reality of radical Islam. It was a public lecture here in Memphis with, for a predominantly non-Muslim audience. And I went to, uh, into a lot more detail about the rise of ISIS. Uh, and I did mention in that lecture uh, that if you look at the circumstances uh, of Iraq from going from one of the most technologically advanced Middle Eastern countries in the 1970s to basically being bombed into the Middle Ages for the last 30 years from our sanctions and our two wars, uh, the fact of the matter is that the entire civil infrastructure of that country has been demolished primarily by, uh, by us, the great superpower of the world. One needs to contextualize in that environment people will cling on to things that are familiar to them, and Islam is very familiar to the uh, people over there. 
yes, Islam does have something called jihad. There's no denying that. Uh, mainstream Muslims view jihad as some type of just war theory. There are times when you need to fight. There are radicals that will take that interpretation and they will misuse it uh, and take their version of fighting against the oppressor into what you see of ISIS. And Muslim theologians, like myself, uh, it is our job to challenge those interpretations of Islam. I am doing them, as I, as I told you, I'm on the assassination list of ISIS because I'm a very vocal critic. But as an American, not just as a Muslim, as an American, it is also my job to point out that we have really messed around in the affairs of that region for the last 35 years. And there is or there are going to be repercussions to a lot of what we're doing uh, in that region. It's not justifying it, it's simply contextualizing it. So that's my point when it comes to Islamic terrorism. One needs to look at the entire picture, not just the text of the Quran, but also the social political circumstances that have been created by many entities, us being the number one on that list. I, I'm assuming Muhammad might want to, since he's coming from an Islamic background, he might want to. Sure. Do you want to skip? Is that okay? Yeah, sure. Um, I agree with a lot of what you're saying in the sense of a lot of it is, that is related to foreign policy. But on the other, other hand, um, there are is scriptural evidence and um, history of Islam that also leads into that. If you're taught from a young age that your view is the right view, and it is the best view, you presume that you should be the most powerful, most advanced society. When that doesn't happen, there must be external factors to blame. There's a, a widespread victim complex kind of thing going on where all problems that occur in the Muslim world are the fault of another, no matter who the other is. Um, if you go to Iran, it's the fault of the UK. In Iraq, it's the fault of the US. Um, and it's not to say that the US is not to blame. Um, if you look at history of colonialism, um, American foreign policy, we have a long history of interfering and all of that does have blowback. But on the other hand, Wahhabism arose before there was colonialism. It had nothing to do with that. Um, war, uh, expansionist wars were waged by Muslims themselves. Um, India, um, I moved from Pakistan. Um, was attacked by Muslims about a thousand years ago when it was attacked, hundreds of thousands of people were enslaved. From that, for that era, that was perfectly normal. All kinds of treaties do that, Rome did that, other nations did that. But we're not clinging to the fact that those eras were moral. And in Islam, we still look back at the original times, uh, Muhammad's era or the early caliphs, or all of those were actually moral. We need to differentiate between certain actions of that era were wrong. And if we start teaching that among our uh, preachings, it'll be far harder for somebody to radicalize instead of romanticizing the past. Isn't that, isn't that broad enough? Can we, can we even broad that though? I mean, if we're talking about, um, if we're talking about people sticking to scriptures and not allowing any sort of, any sort of interpretation, not allowing any sort of admission that morality changes over time, we can look at the Quran, we can look at the New Testament, we can look at the Old Testament. That's why you've got uh, so many different people claiming to be Muslims with very, very differing views. So many people claiming to uh, be Christian with very, very differing views in Judaism. And they all think that their word is perfect. They all find their phrases in their Quran and their holy books and say, okay, this book is perfect. So isn't, isn't the flaw here, isn't the problem, the concept that the books are flaws? Generally, yes, that is a problem, but at least from what I've seen and what I grew up around, um, in Christianity, or particularly in Judaism, the vast majority do not believe that it is flawless. If you look at the Old Testament, there are lots of very violent uh, verses in there. The genocide is mentioned in the Old Testament, but if you talk to the average Jew, they will not talk about that as being divine or something that needs to apply to the present day. If you talk to the average Muslim, whatever is in the Quran is eternal and must be taken at face value. Um, for example, there's a verse about um, a husband's right, so a right over a wife, and it talks about uh, beating your wife. Um, Modern, uh, if you talk to a, a feminist Muslim in the 21st century, they will try to contextualize it and find excuses for it. Um, they will never say that the verse was wrong or it was, it's outdated now. It took us a grand total of five minutes to devolve into a particular Islam session between the back and forth. Yes, yes. and this is exactly what I was kind of concerned about because this panel does not seem to be set up quite fairly. We don't have an ex-Christian on the panel or an ex-Jew on the panel. This is so. so. If you want to, we can talk about an Islamic issue back and forth, but I need to be given the same amount of time and we need to- I agree, would you like to, would you like to 
So we're going to move into a... No, no, no we're, we're, we're not. That's, I just what, it's, know. that's what it's evolving into. This was a very great discussion. We I, I would actually like to pull away from that, but I would, before I do that, I would like to give you an opportunity if there was a specific point. Very well. I, I think that every single religious tradition has this trend of viewing its scripture as being flawless and immutable. I think every religious tradition has its fanatics. All you need to do is look at Israeli settlers and what they're doing in the name of Judaism. And I don't think that's 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 correct. Mainstream Judaism, but they, they, they are out there. Secondly, uh, I think it is also, uh, I think all of us in this room, whether we're of faith or without faith, need to be humble enough to realize that at some level, pretty much every doctrine views itself as being better than other doctrines, even if it is secularism or humanism. There is this notion or element, even amongst many of us in this room, that others need to conform to our understanding of morality. So let's be fair here, that as we're criticizing others, automatically there is this inherent assumption, as we're criticizing them, that my understanding is superior. Now at times that might be black and white, but at times it does get murky. And I think this is one of those areas here where, in the end of the day, every one of us has a set of values that we're very passionate about, and we feel strongly that other people of society should live up to those values. Some people call it secularism, others call it religion. But there are values that most of us do believe should be universal. But you didn't address the point that Muhammad made about the fact that Muslims think that every verse in the Quran is perfect. Do you? I believe the Quran is the word of God, yes. So I don't think I would classify myself as a Muslim if I rejected the Quran. That's my personal opinion. So is rejecting one phrase in the Quran, is looking at some section of the Quran, so, in your view, rejecting all of the Quran? So you're being extremely simplistic here. The word rejection is a very black and white term. Can the, Quran, can the Quran be interpreted in different ways in different times? Yes, it can. No, I mean, there, there are words in the Quran that are there. We should probably move because we got started a little bit late. Um, and, and I would like to go ever so slightly uh, off script and stick with this first question just a little bit, but in a much broader way. Um, and play a, a variation of that old uh, TV game show, uh, Match Game. You guys remember Match Game? You don't? So I, I will put forward a sentence, and it will end with blank, and you need to fill in the blank. And the sentence is, and I think that Gene Raper used to always do, Dumb Dora was so dumb, and the audience would say, how dumb is she? She thinks every member of my religion, or my worldview, is blank. And just a word or a sentence. Immoral. Immoral. Simply trying to sell it. <laughs> the answer I'll give is um, uh, led around uh, unthinking. Um, narrow minded and bigoted. All right. And that leads us into the next question, which is what are the drivers? What are the engines? Why? Do the general, why do the people in the general public have these ideas? Um, can you give us some idea? Because they're they're pervasive, and and they don't seem to go away. Well, there's a, there's a, if I'm, if there's a um, there is a fault within Christianity how we represent our views. Uh, so people on the outside they they only really know about us what they see. And so if we come across reactive, if we come across unreflective, then people's perceptions of us are accordingly. They fit. If we come across thoughtful about what we believe, even uh, affirming uh, scriptural authority, uh, affirming uh, the Bible, taking the Bible as, as the entire word of God, and, and owning up to difficult places in the Bible. Uh, helping people understand what those places are about, what's going on in those particular places, then uh, it, it's a different, it's a different uh, fragrance that's left with people, uh, rather than if, uh, if, if 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 your exposure to Christianity has been of the Bible thumper, uh, God says it, I believe it, that settles it, then your view of Christian faith and people is going to be. Uh, Framed within that, if you're, if you've been around a Christian who's very thoughtful, who's been patient with your questions, who has listened, who has engaged with you, who has been very friendly with you, 
then you're going to have a more favorable view. So some of what persists in the public persona is what happens to just about everything in the public persona. It, it gets uh, it, it, all kinds of uh, elasticity. Uh, it's pulled in all kinds of directions. It's like a Stretch Armstrong doll. Since we're <laughs> reaching back in, uh, in, in cultural, uh, cultural references. So I said immorality. That, uh, that people think that atheists are immoral, and that is because religion says that about us. Um, religion loves to take credit, and I'm speaking big picture religion here, I'm not just talking about Christianity and Islam, I'm talking about religion. Loves to take credit where it's not due. And one of the things that that centers around is, well, whatever good morals you have comes from religion. Um, religion gives you the guidance, religion gives you the advice, religion gives you the word of God, the word of the holy book, and without that, you can't be moral. So the reason that people have such a view of atheism is that that's exactly what religion tells them. If not overtly, if not, if not overtly, it implies it, that without religion, you can't be moral. Um, and that's why the most common question I get, well, where do you get your morality from? Well, atheists get their morality from the same places that religion gets their morality. The religious people get the morality. The only difference is, of course, religion takes the credit where it can. Atheists take the credit and the blame on their own. So when we're talking about why people, why atheists are viewed as immoral, the they're the out, they're the last out, group. and the last out group from and so so all that comes from religion, specifically religion demonizing its out group. You need to be here. You're good because we let you be good. You're good because we taught you to be good. Those who haven't been part of us, they're not good. Well, I think the, the uh, just leading off from where you uh, finished, uh, I think the paradigms are, are very different. Uh, for Muslims, by and large, and I think Christians and Jews would be, I think many of them would be the same. Uh, it is true that morality is the basis of religion. Uh, but for most Muslims, Morality would not be something that radically changes. As, as I said in my last answer, yes, fine-tuning can be done. Yes, reinterpretation. But we're not going to change from, from black to white, from lightness to dark. It's not going to be a complete 180 uh, when it comes to morality. And I think uh, many other Christians and Jews would also uh, say the same thing. So if we were having this discussion maybe 50 years ago, 100 years ago, 200 years ago, the points of, of contention would be different. Uh, from your side, uh, but my religion and, and other understandings of conservative religion would re relatively be the same. I.e., one of the criticisms that atheists have of, of conservative Muslims, which is a valid criticism, is that by and large they don't change with time. It's only fine-tuning going on. That's a valid criticism, uh, because from our perspective, morality does not radically evolve for change. There are, there's only, you know, mind you say that the law allows for change. So, it is possible that a hundred years from now, uh, your descendants, basically, intellectual descendants, are going to be criticizing religion for a whole different list of reasons that probably haven't even occurred to you today, right? And we're still going to be kind of going along the same path. So the two paradigms are very different, as we're trying to say. So if we were to take that to a next step, if we're talking about today's Islam, does today's Islam not talk poorly about atheists? Does today's Islam not say that atheists are less moral and less you know, less valid, less valuable in society? Not less human, but the mainstream Muslims, yes it is true, would view atheists as not having as much of a moral background or moral uh, backbone uh, than, than they do. That's true. That's a fact. I can't deny that. More than more moral background, it's okay to kill us. Well, that is the law in 14 countries, that's true. But you're sitting here, I'm sitting here, am I threatening you? Let's, uh, let's uh, kind of get back to the, the narrower thing. Well, what are the drivers of the misconceptions about uh, Islam? I mean, I, I think some are, are very clear and, and out there. Well, as I said, one of the, one of, one of the fundamental, di fundamental differences is that there are two different paradigms. By and large, Muslims do believe that morality does not radically change from generation to generation. So there is going to be some consistency, whereas those who are not following uh, any type of conservative religious tradition, because I'm not alone here, uh, many Christians and Jews would kind of agree with this, uh, those that are not following these types of views, 
Well, the fact of the matter is, their understanding of morality will change with time. So there are criticisms against those who don't change because they're not changing. Is if the, do you understand what I'm saying? Is the paradigm? Yeah. yeah. If morality changes and you stay the same. You're going to be continued. You're going to be seen as backwardly moral. Yes, that was my point. Two different paradigms. Yeah. Um, so I would argue that is that exactly true in the sense that uh, morality does change in religious groups as well. It changes more slowly. If you look at slavery, all religious groups condone slavery. Now they do not. Um, the thing is, uh, religion applies breaks and slows down progress. It usually is not able to completely halt it. That's a very valid point, and uh, I'm happy you brought that issue up. Uh, this goes back to exactly what I was saying, is that uh, from, and I'm of course a religious scholar and an academic professor, so I can speak as both. Uh, from my perspective as a religious scholar, as a theologian, uh, slavery is definitely one of those issues that Islamic law does allow for change and reforming. Just like with Christianity, that there were times when slavery was justified, and now I don't know any Christian theologian that is justifying slavery. In our times, ISIS has reintroduced slavery, and the entire Muslim world has basically been aghast and, and refuted them. Uh, so these are one of the mechanisms. And I'll give you another example. Uh, murder. Islam is never going to turn around and say murder is permissible in certain circumstances. Because the texts are crystal clear. The texts on slavery, I think, are pretty clear. Uh, and this is what the most of the Mason Muslim world says as well. That it's not something that is binding, that has to be done. It was something that was practiced. Islam doesn't force or command uh, to have slaves. And when there were times when there were slaves, there were slaves. Well, now that there's no slaves, nobody's resurrecting this law and say, or there is no law, excuse me. Nobody's resurrecting this culture and saying, this needs to be done. So we ISIS cannot do what you just said. That. ISIS is doing it. It is doing that, yes. What are the cultural drivers that uh, perpetuate misconceptions about uh, Christianity? Well, uh, let's take slavery as an example. Uh, so the New Testament addresses slaves as slaves. And uh, Christianity has had a very checkered history of slavery. Uh, I won't try to deny that we've had uh, uh, Christians who have advocated for it. We've had Christians who have fought against it. And so that looks almost schizophrenic. So what's, what's going on? Why is there this war within Christianity? And so uh, if, you take, if you take New Testament references to slavery, um, a modern reader will read back into a reference to a slave as a slave in the New Testament context. Uh, they will read back into that a new world experience of slavery, which was fundamentally race-based and rights-denying. First century slavery uh, was not race-based and rights-denying. However, it was still ownership of one person over another. The apostles recognized that as a problem. They also recognized that the only antidote for that was uh, the gospel of Jesus, which is an equalizing uh, philosophy, if you want to use that term. It's, uh, it's an equalizing way of life. And so in the first century, into the second century, you see the church, uh, slaves are treated as free people in the church. While the institutional shell of slavery remains, it's, a, it's effectively gutted uh, within Roman society by the move at, of Christianity. Now, again, as I said, we have a very checkered history with this. And so you get into a new world context and you find uh, all kinds of problems with this, and I won't try to deny that. But I will say that a uh, cultural driver of, of what is a problem, a lot of times you will find people who will just uh, almost like a a matter of something that everybody knows. Well, everybody knows the Bible supports slavery. And uh, again, uh, reading the Bible within its context, there's not a support of slavery. There is a recognition of slavery, and there is a dressing of slavery, but the, the, the way to fight against it was not to call for a revolution. It was to uh, share the gospel. And as people began to see themselves in Christ, uh, for instance, take the New Testament book of Philemon, a great letter to read, a uh, small, tiny New Testament postcard, where you find Paul advocating for a runaway slave, sending him back to his owner to make the right wrong, but saying to the owner, I want you to treat him as a brother. I don't want you to view him anymore as a slave. And that was the gospel at work. But the nevertheless, it still persists.
that uh, the New Testament morality is flawed because slaves are dressed as slaves and, and in a modern context we read that as is why would the apostles call for uh, emancipation you know they ought to call for emancipation and um, there there are that that could have happened uh, but uh, what happened was that there was uh, a move toward uh, we focus on the gospel and that fundamentally changes the way people see each other as a um, as a member of the media I would like to maybe take my share of the blame and some of the misunderstandings and, and ask you guys if, if what I'm hearing is that at root and, and very oversimplified so many of the problems, uh, uh, mischaracterizations, stem from being monolithically defined. Um, is that is that a problem in uh, um, in the, the public relations of the organizations, or is it is it in the way you were defined publicly by uh, in the media? But where what's the source of this monolithic definition of the various faiths or worldviews? If I can start on that. Um Within my own family, um, I'm an atheist. Um, but one of my sisters is a full hijab wearing Muslim woman, and I'm sure she and Yasser Khalid will have a lot in common. Their worldviews are very similar. My mother, on the other hand, uh, prays five times a day, is a, in her words, a devout Muslim, but she believes that the Quran is actually wrong. Um, so within Islamic uh, context, there is a lot of variation. It's not a monolith. But you have um, people um, trying to push that all Muslims are bad, for example. That kind of narrative exists in the media, and it dehumanizes Muslims. On the other hand, you also have a narrative coming that there's only one right way to practice Islam. There are a hundred different ways where there are various sects. People um, project their own morality onto Islam, and that is perfectly valid. What we need is to accept that there's no one single vision that is okay. We need to, there needs to be pluralism and tolerance within our communities. So, so when you're talking about the monolith, you're talking about the perfection, the perceived perfection, the insisted perfection of the holy books, okay? People invent their gods. Every single person invents their own, every single believer invents their own god. That's why there isn't a single believer anywhere who thinks that God disagrees with them on morality issues. That's why you've got one Muslim over here and another Muslim over there. They both say, they both have the same holy book, they both point to different passages, and they both have very different moral values. Same with Christians, same with Jews, same with Hindus, but they all say their book is right and perfect. This is the problem because when you've got a book, when you've got a morality that you think is right and perfect, but you invented the morality, there is no self-reflection. There is only a shield that you put up to protect yourself from criticism. I'm not a bigot. My God is a bigot. I'm just following the word of my God. No, you actually invented the God as a reflection of you. If that weren't true, then people who would be claiming from the same book, people claiming from the same religion, wouldn't be bigots, or would all be bigots if they were true. But the fact is that you can be a Muslim and be anywhere along the scale. And you can be a Christian or a Jew and be anywhere along the scale on morality. Everybody says that their religion is perfect, even though they make it up for themselves. And that's why they have this model. That's why we have the problems that we're getting from the religious community. Because everybody is, is, is saying, I mean, if you look at the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, I don't, I'm not a bigot. I don't hate gays, but God does. And, and that's a problem. And that's where we get the problems that religion causes on all society. That's why religion is a problem in society. Would anyone else like to address? I just wanted to have you asked about the representations of the media. Um, yeah, because I'm, I'm really I'm, I'm yeah. curious about this. So I think the, from from my perspective, I think there's a number of issues that need to be addressed. Firstly, uh, the issue of selective reporting and aggrandization of stories. So, for example, most of us in this room would not be aware that last week a person in Atlanta tried to plant a bomb in a, a park uh, and blame it on Muslims. It was caught. It was a very undercover thing. Not too many people are aware of it. However, if, and he pretended to be, or he, he tried to blame it on Muslims by putting a, a, a Quran in the backpack and whatnot, it turns out he was a self-professed patriot, uh, wanting to bring attention to the threat of radical Islam. 
to which I say it looks like the far right is a greater threat than radical Islamists. But the point being that we hardly heard bleep on any national media. It was just simply not reported. We all know if the person had actually been a Muslim and been caught in the act, how that would have been portrayed. Firstly, secondly, there is clearly a dehumanization when it comes to a Muslim terrorist and a humanization when it comes to people who commit terror in other, uh, uh, in other faiths or, or even in other circumstances. Simple example. Last week, this Lufthansa um, pilot who did what he did, right? Look at the pictures that they're showing of that pilot. He is posing in front of the beach. He is jogging for charity. There's even baby pictures that were published of him, right? Contrast that with when a Muslim does it. Yeah, sometimes Muslims do violent acts in the name of their faith. And you're not going to find pictures of that Muslim, you know, or his family, or what caused him, or, you know, the, what, 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 what you, we, apparently Muslims don't have somebody that can go crazy. It has to be the religion that told them to do it. So crazy people are only the prerogative of normal Caucasians and, and, and Christians. Muslims can't flip their switch, basically. See, so there's this dehumanization. And what happens is, after dozens of such episodes, it's kind of, there's this osmosis in the minds of mainstream America. Islam somehow is much worse than any other faith tradition. And I think these are two of many other factors that could be said the time is limited. Yes, I think uh, all this question of media, um, and I think Dr. Khadi is right. It's, it's monolithic media portrayal is, is a greater problem for uh, Islam. So to take this uh, this pilot in, in Germany, uh, if let's say that as they go through his apartment and his effects, they find Bible study materials, they find that this guy was active in his church, uh, the media would be surprised by that. The media would, would react with shock and surprise. This because we don't ex, we don't associate this with Christian uh, with Christian action, Christian behavior. Again, Christian Christians have had their uh, their share of contributing to the world's pains uh, throughout history. But you don't you don't typically associate uh, the worst of of human actions with uh, I bet a Christian did. That. So uh, our quibble usually with the media is more of a feeling that the media is driven by a certain secularizing narrative that uh, doesn't uh, give uh, often credit to Christians as thoughtful people. And so the person who gets the microphone stuck in their faith is, uh, is, is Bubba. And uh, Bubba says, "Well, you yeah, know, golly, man, that's what that's that's not right. I ain't like America." And 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 Bubba is from First Baptist Church, you know. And so, um, a lot of times, our most thoughtful representatives of our faith don't get asked, "What do you think about this?" And when they do, uh, I've known enough uh, reporters uh, through the years to say it's really refreshing to find somebody who articulates a position that is thoughtful and intelligent and obviously uh, has reflected thought. May I uh, just one Sure, point? absolutely. Yeah, I agree with, with what's being said here, uh, except for the secular Asian, it's a secular angle. I believe it's a Christian angle. Uh, most definitely, uh, the media loves to view Muslims in a negative light. Um, and most definitely, um, I believe it loves to view Christians in the most positive light. A good example is Andres Brevik, uh, the Christian uh, who went to church, the Christian who wrote a book, a, a, a treatise on the Knights of the Templar, the Christian who wrote a note that says, I'm doing this in the name of Jesus, and then went and shot up a bunch of kids in Norway. Uh, the immediate response from Fox News was, he's not a Christian. So they, they went through this, this long effort. Bill O'Reilly did this on the show, all ad nauseum trying to say, okay, this guy, this, this person who did horrible things in the name of Jesus in his own writing, he wasn't a real Christian. Now, if that were flipped around, if that were an atheist, right. if that were a Jew, if that were a Muslim, the story would be completely different. So yeah, I agree that there's a real bias uh, in the news and it's a problem. Uh, and it's not, it's not so much, I, I don't believe it's anti-Muslim or anti-atheist as much as it is pro-Christian. I'm going to combine the last two questions. We're running short. We're wanting to get a, a nice, healthy question and answer in. So um, I want to ask uh, what kinds of discrimination um, members of the panel may have faced as a result of these myths and preconceived notions. 
and to sort of combine that with what we might do to make the conversation more forthright, to kind of end some of these uh, tyrannizing myths for um, not one group, but all of these groups. I, I can definitely begin with that. I think uh, living in America and Tennessee post 9 11 is a very interesting experience for me. Um, there were times where uh, I travel frequently. I'm a, I'm a very well known preacher and theologian. Uh, I, I, have, I travel at least 100 days of the year. I'm actually going to London tomorrow morning. Uh, so there were times uh, before I was such a high profile person where every single time I traveled, I would literally get randomly pulled aside. And it even got more embarrassing than that. I'd have police guards meet me at the uh, door of the plane. At times, my name has been announced. And it's just so humiliating and embarrassing uh, to have to pull your passport out on all the passengers that are staring at you. Then you get thrown into a room, and you have no idea how long you're going to stay. After a 10-hour flight from Europe or whatever, you know, seven, eight, nine hours, there were times where they pulled my family and kids aside. My seven-year-old kid asked, Dad, why, why are the police being so mean to us? You know, I didn't know what to tell them at the time. Uh, thank God I, my profile has now gone so high that the government is, is, is hesitant to touch me because they know I have a lot of social media clout. Uh, but that's not the case with many other Muslims out there. That's the first one from the government. The second from the public population, I have to say I have faced a lot of bigotry and hatred from the general public uh, being called things, uh, the vulgar words are used, um, uh, Bin Laden is still alive. When people see me, they say, Bin Laden is still alive. I've had people come up to me in the street and basically say, get the F out of my country, even though I was born in Texas. Uh, and, and, you know, um, people have, there was even, the worst case for me was that my wife and kids were walking on the street near Memphis, and some teenage, a group of teenage kids, you know, literally zoomed and swerved the car like two feet away from them, yelling things. And that, and I was there, but I was on the pavement. They were up closer to, they were on the pavement, but closer to the road, I'm trying to say. The car literally just zoomed up, and you know, it's just very frightening when you have kids and, and want my wife wears the scarf. So I can definitely tell you that Islamophobia is very real in this country, that there are people that are scared of brown-skinned, Muslim-sounding names of women in hijab, and I think that that's a very, very sad state of affairs that we all need to work to, to eradicate. Yes, I'm sorry. Um, so, now, uh, jumping off your point, you mentioned the word Islamophobia. I want to take an exception with that word, not with the concept. So bigotry exists. I've experienced almost the same things. I've been pulled over in Switzerland. I've been exact same scenarios. I was at an atheist convention in Missouri. And crossing the street, a similar incident happened. A guy pulled up and was Arab to go home. I'm not Arab to begin with. Um, my name is Muhammad. So it's very easy to fall. There is, to an average person, there is no difference between us. Um, but the word Islamophobia tends to conflate criticism of Islam with uh, bigotry toward Muslims. Um, I would appeal that everybody starts using anti-Muslim bigotry. Criticizing Islam, criticizing any idea is imperative. The way we move forward is by criticizing ideas, finding the good parts of them, uh, keeping those and rejecting the bad parts. Putting the, the idea that any uh, ideology cannot be criticized or criticizing an idea is bigoted is harmful for everybody. So we need to distinguish between those two. I, I like to say I agree with you that if you don't like the term Islamophobia, I really don't care. As long as we agree there's anti-Muslim bigotry, you can call it anti-Muslim bigotry, that's fine with me. And then very very quickly before we continue on this line, can, I think it would be interesting if the two of you maybe address the idea of the fine line between criticizing Islam and, and where that can become a, a racist thing. I mean, So as an American Muslim, I have no problem with people like Muhammad or anybody, you know, expressing their views or criticizing whatever they want. My problem comes when you assume I am X, when you want to pull me aside, when you want to try to kill me, uh, when uh, I'm going to have problems getting a job, when people are going to say slurs to my face. That's definitely crossing the line. Me personally, I'm sitting on this panel. I knew uh, Mr. Sayed would be invited. I know his background. It, this, this is America, no big deal. To you, your religion, to you mine. You know, this is not an issue. So I don't have any problem uh, with, with criticism and discussion. But I think it's pretty clear when that discussion moves on to bigotry being singled out, random selections at airports, you know, denying jobs or whatnot. I think that's pretty clear. Is it a case where, where very often you see what is um, broached as criticism of Islam really being sort of uh, functionally xenophobic or, or racist? There are, there are, uh, there's a gray area, obviously. So if you think all Muslims somehow, or the majority of Muslims are this, then yeah, it's kind of, you're feeding into those stereotypes. 
Um, I think it's pretty clear when there's an academic criticism of a concept or theology or juristic opinion, that's clearly a dialogue, versus trying to translate that to show hatred towards you, to try to discriminate against you. So, um, this is a statement from CARE. Um, it's on their website. Uh, they're the Council of American Islamic Relations. Uh, Islamophobia has closed minded peasants against for hatred of Islam and Muslims. An Islamophobe is an individual who holds a closed minded view of Islam and for most prejudice against for hatred of Muslims. What's happening over here is that Islam and Muslims are being conflated, which we need to work against. Well, you can't. I agree. I don't have a problem with that. Let's, uh, let's move on and get uh, a point of view in, in terms of. Uh, um, from the Christian point of view and also from the, uh, the atheist point of view. It would be disingenuous of me to claim any discrimination. I've, I've not experienced any discrimination. However, uh, that doesn't mean that I would not be empathetic uh, to those who have because uh, I am biblically obligated to practice hospitality. And the Greek word hospitality means love of strangers. And so uh, for people to treat other people uh, poorly simply based on external uh, dress or color of skin uh, is uh, a deeply anti-Christian, anti-gospel uh, way of, of believing and responding. Uh, we have Muslim friends uh, from Bangladesh and she wears uh, a haji and you will, uh, on a street in Germantown, often see her walking my little boy home. And uh, it has occurred to me that if uh, some guy comes by and uh, wants to, to make trouble because of the way she's dressed, uh, then, then my own little boy is, uh, is in the crosshairs, potentially. But the reason uh, he's with her is because she is our friend, and we love her, and she is uh, fully and vibrantly Muslim, and we are fully and vibrantly Christian, and we've been in each other's homes, and we've taught each other uh, how to make uh, certain dishes. I say my, my wife and she have uh, taught each other uh, different dishes. Uh, so there are ways uh, around these particular issues, and, and I do think you find good exceptions uh, to some of this. And so you, you do find, uh, for instance, uh, at my oldest son's school, uh, one of the teachers, Christian school, one of the teachers uh, has a small group of atheist friends, and they have coffee uh, weekly, and they talk about religion, philosophy, and the world, and uh, there's no, there's no they, they have deep differences, but it doesn't keep them from treating each other humanely. Uh, and people who fear other people, I, I wouldn't say the problem is, is uh, religion. I would say the problem is, is human nature. Uh, and that that is the fundamental problem, is that we all carry within ourselves uh, the, 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 the things that, that make society difficult, whatever labels we wear in life. This hotel is about to fill up with about a thousand people who face bigotry in their lives. Um, children thrown out of the house from their parents, uh, people who have lost friends, people who have lost family members, family members who have split up, families who have split up, all because of the bigotry against atheists, promoted as gospel, promoted as correct by religion. So when we're talking about bigotry, and yes, bigotry is ugly, bigotry is stupid, bigotry is something that we as a society should be moving beyond, we must look towards religion when we're talking about bigotry against atheists because religion preaches it. Religion says that morals come from religion. Religion says that people without that religion are less moral, less human, less valid parts of society. Uh, this is the problem for atheists. Um, it's not a human nature thing, it is a religion thing, and I can show you that because we don't do it back to you. There's nothing in atheism that says religious people are all stupid, or religious people are bad, or religious people are immoral. This is only coming from religion, and it's all coming under the guise of it's down from God. Again, people are bigoted, and they blame their God as if they use their religion as a shield. They blame their God for giving them the bigotry, and then they defend it, and then they use it as kind of a get out of get out of a conversation free card, get out of bigotry, bigotry free card. You can't blame me, it's my religion. Oh, it's your religious right. No, it's not. It's ignorance, it's putrid, it's yesteryear, and it needs to go away, and it's up to religion to start preaching tolerance for everybody and not saying that we're better than them. Well, I, I think to be fair uh, on that point, I mean, we can trade anecdotes 
uh, I've read atheist blogs and know that they do uh, descend into name calling. And oh yeah, individuals do, but it's not part of atheism. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I was going to say, again, it's not too busy to push the stage off of the thing. So I would say that uh, to this point, I mean, it, it raises a good a fundamental difference. What, when you look at philosophies and religions within humanity, what philosophies and religions, it's an ultimate question, what philosophies and religion uh, have within, within them, when they're at their best, uh, the power to restrain what are the darker, most negative impulses of human nature. I think when Christianity is at its best, it does that. When people are following Jesus, his way, his will, you get a better quality of person. So, um, That's a horribly bigoted thing to say. Well, I'm not, ex I'm not, where in that statement are you hearing that an atheist can, where are you hearing me say atheism is immoral? And when when, when said, you say, say Christianity is at its best, at its best, yeah. Right? So that when Pretty somebody people is following are, Jesus, uh -huh. you're going to find a person who is typically morally, relationally, a person you'd be glad to have as your neighbor, a person who's going to look out for you, a person who's going to e exhibit compassion. You're not saying that's exclusive I'm not saying to Christianity. Exclusive. You're I'm just saying that saying in the case of Christians who are at their best, they are. I'm not saying you, you can't. Uh, I mean. There are a lot of that at best is a judgment call that we're making on an individual level. The Westboro Baptist Church thinks they are Christianity at its best. <laughs> Granted, they do. Yeah. But uh, we have ways uh, of assessing whether people are being biblically faithful or not. They will say that they are being more biblically faithful than they you. will. Uh, this is what the look, problem if, is. If you want to descend into comparing what atheism has done that's been bad in the world, and what Christianity has done is that, well, that's not where I'm going, and atheism hasn't done anything. Atheists do it in an individual I'll, I'll see your I'll see your Westboro Baptist and I'll raise you a Stalin. Oh my God. Yeah. Oh. Well, well, that's, that's, that's difficult. difficult. I think it's now maybe time to move into the question and answer period. <laughs> Before. Yeah, no, please. Um, so one of the issues is that um, you should look at the world from the perspective that um, this is the right path no matter what the path is, and if you don't follow it, you'll be tortured and burned forever and ever. It's a natural human impulse that comes from love, that if my child isn't going in that direction, I need to do whatever I can to prevent that, because my child will suffer. A lot of these reactions come from a place of love. Um, so within our group, uh, we have people from about 30 different countries. Um, there's Somali kids. Um, when he was 16, he left for religion. He told his parents. His parents locked him up and beat him. They had the entire extended family get together. So, uh, a Rocky girl, she was 19. Um, her family keeps her out in front of the killer. And the point was they were trying to scare her to come back to religion. If you view that this is the only way, um, extreme reactions are understandable because if they aren't able to reform the child, the child will suffer greatly. Um, taking it on, onto a global level, that's why we have these laws as well. The idea is that if you leave religion, um, you will corrupt society and all of these people. Uh, so it's better to cauterize the wound right now and eliminate this infection before it spreads and a lot of other people have to suffer. That's why um, historically, and in, as I was saying, in a lot of Muslim countries, these laws still exist. I would ask uh, Yasser Bali and any other Muslims, so from my perspective, it's a moral imperative that people that live here that have the ability to affect change in other countries do so. And Muslims over here are uniquely positioned to be able to lobby to end blasphemy laws, lobby to end apostasy laws, and all of us should be working to achieve that. I think you're... Uh making American Muslims far more powerful than they are. Our voices are not heard in the Middle East, not just because of a language barrier, but because of an authority barrier. Uh, people who are uh, uh, born and raised and graduated from their versions of, of seminaries are considered to be far more authoritative in, the, in their religion than a person born in Texas, even if you studied a few years and then come back here. So I think you're kind of making it bigger or making our role bigger globally. I'm not state. saying it is right now. I'm saying it can be and it should be. Maybe. If you look at the most of we're a tiny, tiny percentage and we're standing up. I would say we look at, we're living at a burning building and running back into it because we see a problem and want to fix that problem for our people that are in other countries. And the same exists um, for other minority groups that want to fix the problem they see. Very well. I just have to say here that Muslims are 1.6 billion people. To assume that one person or one group will somehow speak or influence all of them 
I'm far more pragmatic. I am concerned with American Islam or even Western Islam at a broader level. I'm concerned with Muslims living in secular democracies and navigating our faith through modernity. And that's really what my role is. If you Google my name, I'm sure you know a little bit about me in this regard. I'm more concerned with American Islam. Blasphemy laws in Pakistan, I mean, theoretically they're interesting and I would love to talk about them, but I don't think I'll influence or have any. Personally, I really don't believe they're, they're valid or Islamically sound, but. So, so you're opposed them? Yes, definitely. Yes. Okay. But we do need to move on to the question and answer uh, portion of, the, of uh, this opening meeting. And before we uh, turn to the audience and the uh, questions on the note cards, is there anyone here from the media that has a question that they would like to ask any ask the panel generally or any specific member of the panel? Anyone? I haven't seen any cards. Has anyone collected question cards? I can collect them if you want. Uh, could you, yeah, could you please? If you have cards. Yeah, if you have cards. Seems to me that the press is the press. Is that correct? Especially television and radio newscasters promote a belief in Christianity and in. I, I had a martini before I came. <laughs> that's all right. Go ahead and ask me. I'll, I'll be happy. Your penmanship is wonderful. Do you want? Can you hear? Do you want to say this out loud? Because I can't. Can I read it? Yeah. Sure. Are you asking me to? Yes, it's me, Reverend. It seems to me that Speak the press... Is this working? I don't think this is on. Hello? Oh, yeah, this is on. It seems to me that the press, especially television and radio newscasters, promote a belief in Christianity and miracles. For instance, if someone survives a plane crash or a tornado where many others are killed, newscasters will often say it was a miracle that so-and-so survived. However, they never questioned the miracle that caused the plane to crash or the tornado to occur. Were the deaths caused by these events also a miracle? Who is responsible for causing these events if God caused them a miracle to save a certain person? Okay, thank you for your question. I, I don't know that there really is much of a theology that informs when people are making those comments. Uh, I don't know that they're thinking through a theological construct. You're asking a question from a vantage point of when, when media is out report on things. So that, you know the plane crashes, two people survive, everybody calls it a miracle. And I, I think they're probably using miracle in the in the in the general sense of a lot of people use the word sin. You know, about the sins of the government or uh, something like that. It's not necessarily that theology is attaching to that. So if you come into a church and you hear a pastor say uh, that two people survived this crash and it's a miracle. Uh, essentially what, what he is saying is that uh, he may not be really thinking about it much either. He's saying that uh, what we expect to have happen in that moment, uh, two people survived through it. Well, I, don't, I don't use the language of the miraculous very often. I was talking. I was questioned by CNN not too long ago. They were doing a special on a plane crash, and uh, this plane crash had one survivor, a little girl, and they were doing a special on the miracle of her survival. And, it, and they said, "Well, what do you give?" And, and and they didn't use me for the special because what I gave them was not friendly. It was right on the line. It was you know. It was right on, you know, God caused the plane crash. God killed all those other people. God chose those other people to die. God picked one, this one little girl to live. Why? And they actually have, um, they actually have a condition called survivor guilt, which is when you survive a plane crash that, or, or an event that other people die, and you think God wanted it that way. And you feel guilty that God picked you over other people. So this is one of those places, one of those manifestations 
where religion actually serves to hurt, where you can't just say, I got lucky. You've got to say it was divine and God picked me over other people. Why? And it actually causes a bona fide condition of guilt. How about the tornado? We're, we're doing, we need to do questions on cards. If you have a question, you need to write down on a card. Um, the next question is uh, addressed specifically to uh, the believers on the panel. And it is, have you ever questioned your faith? And do you feel that your morality would diminish without your faith? Um, I don't mind answering that question. Uh, have I questioned my faith? I have definitely questioned interpretations of my faith that have evolved over the last uh, um, 20, 25 years uh, from positions theological and legal that I've held. Um, I've never found myself actually questioning uh, the existence of God um, personally. Um, so I've never had a crisis of that type of faith. Not that the opportunity hasn't arisen, but people are different and it just hasn't happened to me uh, personally. Uh, do I think I would be less of a moral person if I didn't believe in a scripture? And again, it is my opinion, my personal opinion, that I think I would because uh, personally I feel uh, more morally responsible knowing that uh, my creator wants me to live up to a certain standard, that my prophet wanted me to exemplify a certain methodology. Now it could be biased, I obviously am biased, I don't know what life would be like without those those things in place. So for me personally, I personally cannot see myself being as moral uh, as uh, as I am. But I have no problems admitting that of course my bias has never stepped outside my paradigm. Differently moral, would you say? I mean, does it, is it necessarily diminishing or would it just be differently moral? So again, I would define morality uh, in a different manner. So from an Islamic perspective, it's immoral to take drugs. It's immoral to drink and become drunk. Maybe some people don't think that's immoral. Are these, are these expressly the things, or is this the purview of, of disbelief? Is, is that how no, it's immoral? immoral? I mean, you, you use the word immoral. Right. So for me, it's immoral. It's just not morally right to, to take drugs. Gotcha. So uh, I think if I didn't have the religion, maybe I would do these things. But I'm, I'm, I guess I'm asking is, is is based on that is the assumption that people who lack belief are more likely to take drugs and drink alcohol and live a wild life. Is that the is that, that the is, is, is that the residue? Well, I'll be honest. That is the assumption. That, that, that is the assumption. Yeah. Okay. Can I add a comment? Sure. Um, yeah. It was mentioned before that slavery is um, not expressly prohibited. Uh, what Dr. Yakhman just said was that alcohol is especially prohibited. You can look at the moral scale. So I would answer the question the same way, uh, I mean, pretty much the same way as, as Dr. Cotty, in that uh, I've never personally had uh, reason to question uh, that God is there or that He can be personally known. Uh, I was raised in a Christian home. Uh, I had opportunities, as, as he, Dr. Cotty has had through studies, to engage with uh, people who don't believe, people who've lost belief, people who've never had it. Uh, I've walked with a number of people who are questioning their faith, and uh, I hope that our church is a safe place for people to question their faith and to work through uh, doubts. Uh, but uh, personally, I've never uh, gone through that. Uh, as to morality, I, what I'm more interested in as, as I get older is a morality that transcends self-interest. And that's going to necessitate that at times um, I need an authority over me to tell me no. So um, if I have a God who is um, always... Um, how to put this? If if my God is is basically um, a Stepford God, so a, a God who never contradicts me, uh, a God who, um, who who never says no to me, then I really have a God of my own making. And so uh, I, uh, being a a sinful person, uh, I have interests and desires 
uh, that I don't need to act on. And so uh, I need to stay faithful to my commitments. I need to stay uh, faithful to uh, to laws. Uh, and so morality, a morality that transcends self-interest, is not only self-giving and leads me to sacrifice myself at times when I might want to preserve myself, to give when I might want to keep, but a morality that also tells me no. I, I can't have that, even though I may want it and desire it, because it's not good for me or it's not good for someone that I love. All right, you know, uh, David, you know, I, I might actually want to, I, I know this was addressed specifically at the non-believers, but this might be an interesting opportunity. You, you identify both as atheist and as, as Jewish, is this correct? No, I used to. I you used to. Both, but no, I, I'm, I'm just curious, I'm curious because Judaism, and we don't have a representative, and I know that there's a tradition of kind of wrestling with, with faith and wrestling with the ideas, and I, I didn't know if you could. Well, in Judaism, there's a, there's a tradition of argument. Okay. Right. The, 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 the old joke is if you get three Jews in a room, you get four opinions. <laughs> right? uh, so they argue with each other, and that's part of the, 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 the mentality. Uh, I don't like to call it a Jewish culture because the Jewish culture isn't real either, but the mentality of Judaism is that it's okay to question everything except the existence of God, but that leads to people questioning the existence of God, and that's why there's a whole lot of atheists who call themselves Jews, uh, like I was. Um, and I, I think that um, I, I think that's a, a good thing because it gets people to really to deal with their doubts. So really, what, I, I have kind of a tough question to my to my religious friends. Uh, you're both you both just said that neither of you have questioned the religion in which you were raised. So I'd like to ask you each a question about each other. Is it a good thing or a bad thing? that the other person has not questioned his faith. I personally believe that uh, if a person feels a connection with a higher power, call him God, uh, that that is a very positive thing for society. I don't mind the religiosity of a fundamentalist Christian as long as it doesn't lead to bigotry of others. Like I, I, I like Christians and Jews and people of faith that are religious and I find a connection with them. But should he, would it benefit him, would it be better for him, do you think he should consider dropping Christianity for Islam? Only if he wants to. If he wants to, it's his decision. Same, same deal. It's not, it's, it's not compulsion. Do you think he's going to hell? No, that, well, in Islamically, I have, an, I have an academic paper on this, by the way, you should reference this. The, the orthodox theological position of Islam is far more nuanced than a black and white. Well, so, I was talking to, to, oh, sort of, to the father, to, to, to the Reverend Cole. Uh, the, um, you, you think he's going to hell. Don't you think he should consider Christianity? Don't you I think, think he should consider Christianity, but, um, but I respect his intellect, and I respect uh, that he uh, makes choices. In, in life, and, and I have no reason to distrust uh, Dr. Cotty's intellect or the way that he thinks about things. So my approach to Dr. Cotty for talking about matters of, of Christianity, what Christianity affirms that one needs to believe for a right relationship with God, uh, I would affirm all those things to him, but in friendship and in a desire to continue friendship with him, the friendship wouldn't be wouldn't be based on. Uh, any thought of even eternal destiny or um, uh, of uh, anything other than let's be friends and let's uh, in engage with each other as we wish on these points. Let's talk about them, and that's what we would do. But I, I wouldn't. I, I've never. I never force uh, decisions uh, upon people. We present the truth plainly. This is what the New Testament says. We commend ourselves in good conscience. We present the truth plainly. And we allow uh, the truth to do the work that it does. This question is for David Silverman specifically. What do you mean when you say religion takes the credit and what's not written is for morality? And where do you get your morality? That's exactly what I was saying before. Religion takes the credit. Religion tells you you're a good person. And here is, it is in the book. That's why you're a good person. Religion tells you that it teaches you morality. 
religion does not teach morality. Because religion is so broad, all of religion is so broad, it just teaches you what you already know. So religious people get their morality from the same place as atheists. The only difference is that religious people go to church. Can you define that place? What's the place that it comes from? Oh, society. Okay. Society, our upbringing, you know, our brains, the, 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 a very, very complex web of our society, of our upbringing, our parents, our experiences. It's a complex thing. That's why there's so much breadth <coughs> in Christianity, so much breadth in Judaism, so much breadth in the morality of these religions in Islam, because it all really doesn't come from those religions. It comes from the rest of that web. But then religion comes in and says, aha, you don't believe in killing people. Well, it says in my book that you don't like to kill, but killing people is bad. Therefore, we gave you this. But they didn't. They just took credit. So religious people and atheists get their morality from exactly the same places. Not of the truth is, is religion. Religion simply takes the credit. And that makes a bigotry. That creates the bigotry. When, when religion says, we teach you morality, when somebody says, if I left my religion, I would lose my morality, that's an evidence of the bigotry against atheists that religion creates. All right. This is a question for the, the panel, and it is, I think I'm reading this correctly, and if, if I'm off, then someone can correct me. Why do the majority of scientists profess to be non-believers, or non-religious, or non-believers? I think there's actually a figure attached to that. Is it something like 80%, 85%? I believe it's 92. Is it 92%? Yeah, yeah. It's it's, and and it's, it's about learning. You know, science is learning, okay? Science is, all right, well, I think it's this way. Let's test it. Oh, look, that test failed. All right, maybe it's something else. Let's test that. Oh, that, that test work, works. Well, what do you think? Well, let me try it. Oh, look, that test works for me, too. Peer review. That's the way it works. That's science learning. But when you're, when you're looking at religion, religion says, you know, this is the way it works. You know, God made the universe 6,000 years ago in, in six days. Um, well, we can test and disprove that, okay? Uh, in the beginning, God created heaven and the earth. The earth was waste and void. Darkness was upon the face of the deep. And God said, let there be light. Clearly says, earth came before light. Well, we can disprove that. So the book is not perfect and provably so. So that's what makes it atheists. Let's move down to the end of the table. I don't have statistics memorized, uh, but I would venture if you were to ask uh, Muslim uh, scientists in Muslim majority countries or Christian scientists in Africa uh, or Hindu scientists in India, you would not get the statistics of American scientists in America. A little bit of postmodernism would tell us that we are all products of our own civilization and culture. And the very fact that uh, uh, agnosticism and atheism is so high in certain parts of the world and not in others reflects the changing morality and the paradigm shift taking place amongst us. Uh, and therefore, I think it's highly skewed and selective to say that 92% of scientists uh, uh, believe X when you're viewing or, or when you're interviewing scientists of a certain uh, geographic region of a certain time and place. Most scientists, even of medieval Christianity, even in post-enlightenment, uh, even Darwin himself, some would argue, and again, I know there's a dispute here, were some type of deists or some type of religious uh, people. Most of the founding fathers were not quite Christian, yet they were also religious in their own way. So they're, all of us, including myself, are products of our time and place. And I think a little bit of humility and also studying postmodernism would kind of make us realize why uh, the statistics are so high for one particular location at one particular time. May I respond to that? Sure. Because when we're talking, when we're talking about America, and yes, 92% ideal is American, okay? Yeah. But we have a, a dramatic minority here. Most of those 92% of scientists were raised Christians. They weren't raised atheists. This isn't an atheist country. We're not living in Scandinavia here. We're living in America. Most of these scientists were raised Christians and were convinced to be atheists, one would logically speculate, that uh, from the evidence that they found in science, don't you think? But it's raised Christian within a very different uh, political, cultural context. Is that? That's my point as well, that Christians of Africa are not the same as Christians of America, Hindus of India, Buddhists. Yeah, but they made the change. Yeah. One thing is you need space to be able to present and think about critically. So for example, in Pakistan, 
Um, there's a Muslim uh, scientist from Israel. Um, he's a reformist. He wants science to be taught. Evolution is not taught in Pakistan. Um, there have been attempts to kill him. That's for being progressive enough that we should teach the entire spectrum of science. If you don't have enough space to descend, to think about science, um, good science won't happen in those countries, and people can't publicly talk about what they actually believe in. Okay. I think we probably got time for one more question, if we keep it pretty brief. Um, and it is specifically for Dave. Have you ever done anything as head of American atheists, which, in your own judgment, reinforces any misconceptions about atheists? Well, I think one of the misconceptions about atheists is that we're angry, is that we're all angry. And sometimes I can get pretty angry. Yeah, so, I mean, there, there's, there's, there's that, okay? And yeah, I, I, I knowingly do that. I have to do that because anger is what gets played. Anger is what gets news. And when somebody gets in my face, I get angry about it. And of course, when we're talking about bigotry, when we're talking about the negative effects of religion on society, the multiple negative effects, I get angry. Uh, and so we have these debates on television, and I have these debates where it can get pretty heated. And I think that reinforces, unfortunately, the negative stereotype that atheists are angry. Because, you know, like we, like we all have seen, you know, one person does represent, you know, just like Bo. <laughs> um, but uh, I think that's a, 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 an incredibly important thing to do because, damn it, I am angry. And I have to express that. Now, this was aimed at Dave, but I would like to extend it to the rest of the table. Have you ever participated in anything that, in your judgment, might have helped to reinforce some of the stereotypes that the general public holds? So the general public holds the idea that the only reason people leave Islam is to drink. I do drink. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm sure I have. Uh, I'm sure I've gone to events and uh, been present at uh, Christian events where people say, you see, the, the, all the folks over there. Uh, I went to a Promise Keepers event uh, 15 years ago, 16, 20 years ago. So uh, uh, there were a lot of stereotypes uh, that came out of uh, came out of that. Uh, so yeah, I'm sure. I think I think anybody who logs miles leading organizations is going to have uh, times where uh, we become guilty of the very thing that we uh, that we think we are are trying to uh, move against. Well, according to the TSA's latest uh, blog that was released about uh, suspicious signs when you're traveling, I think I fit the bill for at least six of the 30 on that list. Shifty eyes, not staring at people, walking in somewhat of an agitated manner on the airport, rushing to catch your flight. So, I think, I think I meant... Rushing to catch your flight? Uh, How dare you? <laughs> <laughs> well, if you're a Muslim running in the, in the airplane or in the uh, airport, it kind of does roll. Uh, on a serious note, I honestly can't think of anything, uh, but again, I'm sure uh, people read in um, uh, when they see someone like me with my name or not, but I can't, I can't think of anything else on my head. We are at the end of our allotted time. I would like to thank our distinguished panel, but most importantly, I'd like to thank everyone who came out for having this conversation. Thank you for all the time and thank you to the rest of you for coming. I really appreciate it. And I welcome to Memphis. Thank you. Have a good time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you.